Elon Musk has said a lot recently about local maxima and minima as they relate to full self-driving beta. So I think it's worth a little bit deeper dive to discuss just what that actually means and why it's so important to Tesla full self-driving. Plus in more topical news, we have Starlink in Ukraine, a VIN for a Model Y made in Texas, and a Rivian factory going up 45 minutes from my home in Georgia. Let's take a look. For those of you interested in investing, check out Webull, an amazing platform for buying and selling stocks, and now cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Dogecoin, and others. Open an account and get a free stock valued at up to $200, and fund your account and get another free stock valued at up to $1,600. Check out the link in the description and help the channel at the same time. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. So I'm gonna start with the Ukraine news and for those who are not interested in this stuff, I'm going to leave chapter markers in this video so that you can easily skip over the parts that you're not interested in. I feel like some people are triggered by all of this stuff right now. So anyway, I'm giving you fair warning and I'm talking right now so that you can go ahead and skip if you're not interested. But anyway, let's first focus on Starlink in Ukraine and why it's so important and actually why SpaceX is so important in general. So let's start with a tweet from February 26 from Mikhailo Fedorov, and I hope I pronounced that somewhat close to correctly. Elon Musk, while you try to colonize Mars, Russia tries to occupy Ukraine. While your rockets successfully land from space, Russian rockets attack Ukrainian civil people. We ask you to provide Ukraine with Starlink stations and to address sane Russians to stand. I assume the latter means to stand up with the people of Ukraine. Incredibly, just a few hours later, Elon Musk responded, Starlink service is now active in Ukraine, more terminals en route. So, of course, I'm not going to go over the whole thing that's going on in Ukraine right now. It's an absolutely, in my mind at least, insane act on Vladimir Putin's part. I don't believe that this is indicative of the Russian people's attitude about this stuff. I think it's just a small cadre. Totally my opinion. <laughs> Take it or leave it as you will. More to the point in this specific case is that Elon Musk was able, almost dead instantaneously, to turn on Starlink satellite service. Again, Starlink, for those who don't know, is a blanket of satellites that is orbiting the Earth at low altitudes. They're zipping around. It's very technically challenging, but basically they've created a web in low Earth orbit, and you have to have kind of a pizza box-ish size receiver. It's I know it's the shape is different now, but anyway, that's approximately the size, right? So you know something along these lines. Anyway, you need only something like that in order to receive and to send full internet at very, very high speeds. So this is a critical thing. You know, the, the, the pitch line for this was that Starlink could be used in rural areas where people could not access high speed internet to allow more equalization between the haves and the have nots in terms of internet technology. But there's another use case for this, and that is for people who are being oppressed by others. So one of the difficulties with land-based internet services is that they can be cut, right? All you have to go to go to the choke point and turn it off. Starlink, on the other hand, is very, very difficult to shut down, I guess, unless you created a Kessler syndrome and basically just destroyed everything in orbit, which talk about cutting off your nose to spite your face in that case, because you would be just as screwed as a powerful country as everybody else. But anyway, aside from doing that, Starlink is almost impossible to shut down. You could do things to create radio interference and stuff like that to attempt to do that, but it's very difficult because it's incredibly di diffuse, right? The satellites are diffuse and the receivers are diffuse. So you could also think about it like centralized energy, speaking of Russia and their oil and gas resources versus diversified or diffuse resources. <clears throat> versus diversified or diffuse energy, as in solar panel, wind, et cetera, that can be generated locally that doesn't require a large country, a large centralized block to be able to provide this energy. My line, which I know I'm stealing from somebody else, and if you remember actually what the original quote source is, let me know in the comments. But anyway, information wants to be free. The biggest fear a totalitarian government has is information. That is that people will get information and be able to trade information freely. Information wants to be free, it's very, very difficult difficult to control. And you can see every totalitarian government in history, one of their main things was a propaganda and information wing to try to tamp down on the amount of information that comes out to the public. So anyway, Starlink, much, much to the good. In addition to that, of course, Elon Musk's SpaceX also has the Crew Dragon and Cargo Dragon, which is a really good alternative to the Soyuz in terms of getting to the space station, the International Space Station. 
a lot of tension going on there right now. I'm going to touch on this more. I should be doing an interview with Ellie in space this afternoon. I'm really, really happy about that. So anyway, I don't know when her video will come out, but I will certainly talk more about Crew and Cargo Dragon with her in that video. And yes, Crew and Cargo Dragon are not perfect substitutes for the Soyuz. So that's what we're going to talk about in our interview, at least part of that. So <laughs> I'll get into that. If we don't end up talking about that in our talk this afternoon, I'll definitely do another video of that on this channel. So anyway, stay tuned. In more positive news, the first officially verified VIN or vehicle identification number has been assigned to a Model Y performance coming out of the Giga Texas factory in Austin. And as you can see from this tweet, even more interestingly, the delivery date is March 1st through March 29th, which means that it could actually be very, very soon, like next week. Now, I think the, the wide range in terms of delivery has nothing to do with the manufacturer of the vehicle. It's probably already made and sitting in Texas waiting to go to a lucky customer in Colorado, who actually is the first person that we know of that's received one of these VINs. But I think the regulatory bodies that have to do all the testing and the safety stuff before a car can officially be sold from a given factory factory haven't completed that yet and so there's a kind of what a four week range between the earliest and the latest probably mostly depending on when the safety tests come back and you know hopefully they will all be very positive and everything will go well so anyway that's super super interesting and amazing news that there could be a car out next week from the texas factory the next piece of positive news actually has to do with my home state of georgia rivian receives good news to accelerate its expansion in the state of georgia so let's scroll down here a little bit. Raging EV war. Rivian, if you don't know Rivian, they make trucks. They make the R1T and the R1S. The R1T is a truck. The R1S is an SUV built off the same platform. Anyway, really, really cool looking vehicles. I can't wait to test drive one of them soon. I Actually, if anybody who's working at Rivian watches this video, please, please, I, I'm 45 minutes away from your place. I will actually show a map that shows how close I am to where you are. I would love to be some boots on the ground, you know, looking at the factory, going to the events, talking to you guys. It would be fantastic. My, my channel would love it. I'm sure that everybody watching it would love it. So anyway, I'll put in a little plug for me going and going to the factory and attending and everything. So anyway, the factory is going up in Stanton Springs. There is some controversy about this. The state government essentially has taken over, as we say, no more hearings. Sorry about this bar in the middle of the web page. How annoying is that? I think it's supposed to be an advertisement, but whatever it is, it's not there. It's just an annoying bar in the middle. But anyway, the, the state of Georgia has taken over from Morgan County. In terms of dealing with concerns from the community. It sounds like they've kind of cut off some avenues of you know, talking about all of these things. Anyway, I'll put a link to this article in the description, but as you can see here, you know, we appreciate the perspective in your recent letter that the state of Georgia consider taking the lead on the next steps with the Rivian Automotive Project, the person from Morgan County said. And there's there's a lot of issues with that because the local community, there's a lot of people who are very unhappy about the rezoning of the land. It's, I think, 2,000 acres that they're rezoning for the factory. Anyway, it's incumbent on Rivian to be a good citizen and to try to do the best that they can with this situation since it's been taken out of the community's hands to a large extent. And as you can see from further down in the article, the Rivian investment will be on the order of $5 billion and have 7,500 jobs. Many of those will be like kind of high tech jobs. So that's actually really, really good for the state. And they expect to start operations in 2024 and produce up to 400,000 vehicles a year. So this is going to be a big factory. And of course, this sentence is very important. For us to be successful in Georgia, it's important that we spend time listening to local concerns, addressing them as best we can, and working hard to be the kind of neighbor the community would like to see, a Rivian spokesman said in an email statement. So anyway, I hope that that's true. I, I think it could be really, really to Georgia's benefit. I've been pressing for Tesla to have a factory here. I figured they have one in California, one in Texas, one in Georgia would be perfect in terms of splitting the country. So you never know, there could actually be a third Tesla factory in Georgia to split the country. It seems like a really good place to have one, but I'm super pumped that Rivian has decided to put one in here. And I hope that they can deal with community concerns and make everything work as well. They should take a page from Tesla's book with the Gigafactory Austin and try to set aside some of it to become like a walking trail and a nature center or something like that. I think that would help go a long way to creating goodwill with the community. So we'll see what they decide to do. But anyway, I'm really looking forward over the next two years to see how the factory comes about and to see how the community responds to it and how Rivian responds to it. So here's to good luck that things will go well in the state of Georgia. 
All right, so on to the local maximum minima argument. Elon Musk recently tweeted that LiDAR is a seductive local maximum, and I actually did a video on that. Definitely check out the link in the description because it's actually part and parcel of this video. I kind of meant to talk about it in the previous one, but I also knew it was gonna be enough information that might justify a separate video. So anyway, this is a separate video if you just ignore the first half, which is more of a news thing. All right, so first of all, local maximum, local minimum. These two things are actually kind of equal equal to each other. I prefer to talk about local and global minima as opposed to maxima because minima are bounded. They're generally bounded by zero. If you have a 0% error, then you don't have any problems, right? So whereas the maximum, which is the inverse of it, right? You just flip it upside down, can actually be unbounded and go towards infinity. So I personally prefer to say local minima and global minimum. But Elon Musk, on the other hand, likes to say local and global maximum. So anyway, it's it's a semantic thing. It doesn't really matter that much. You can actually look at this graph right here. So you have a, you know your search thing. You're trying to figure out the best state to be in, and that could be like the best full self driving. Like so, zero percent error would basically be that the car drove perfectly, right? So that's kind of what you're looking for. That's your global minimum. So you might start here with your full self driving beta, and you descend for a while, and you're like, oh. This looks like the best that we're going to do. It, it's, it's a complicated thing. You don't really know. You got to remember, you can't see this entire space here, right? You can't see the wiggly lines. You're searching around blind. So you have to think about yourself like you're a mountain climber in a blizzard on a mountain someplace. And all you can do is kind of take a few steps around and see which direction leads down. So that's what you're doing here. You're like, okay, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Oh no, it's leading up again, right? So at that point, you're like, oh, I must be on the ground and I must be safe and sound. But unfortunately, you're still on the side of K2 and you're probably going to die because you're above the death zone. So this is not good. You want to actually get down here to this global minimum, not to this local minimum. But if you can't see anything, if it's a blizzard and you're walking around and you start to take steps up in every direction, you're like, well, heck, I'm, I'm at the minimum I can be. I can't get any lower. So you have to, there's a whole bunch of strategies to sort of mitigate this. One of my favorite old school machine learning techniques is called simulated annealing. And annealing is the cooling process with materials like metals that actually get cooler and cooler and they crystallize as they become cooler and they seek a, a kind of a minimum energy state in the crystal. So simulating that, what you do is you actually at the beginning, you provide energy. So if you think about this blue dot here where you are, instead of just taking a little bit of a gradient descent each you know step you're taking, what you can do is provide energy so that this thing's kind of bouncing around all over the place. It's a very high energy state at the beginning. So it very well might jump all the way down to here and go like, oh, this is lower than this is. So that's good. And then it might go woo and jump down here and go like, oh, this is lower here, right? So at the beginning, when you have high energy, you're actually producing a bunch of random noise to this little guy instead of just letting it walk downhill very slowly. So that allows you to get into this pocket. And then as it cools down, it lets you sink and sink and sink and sink, right? So the thing's bouncing around, bouncing around. It's going ding, 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 like that. But then as it loses energy, it sinks down into this. So ideally, in a simulated annealing sort of situation, you end up down here and not in one of these local minima as opposed to a global minimum. Again, just for completeness, this would be what Elon Musk would be talking about instead. I like to think about low energy states. He likes to think about maximum in terms of like maximum performance. It actually sounds better. I think semantically, it sounds better to people outside to go like, oh yeah, maximum, that's the best we can do. But you can see how basically this is just the inverse of this, right? This is going down to the minimum state and this is going up to the maximum state. And you've got these local maxima and stuff like that. So essentially they're the same thing. And speaking of energy, this diagram sort of shows that you've got energy and you're trying to find the lowest energy state. So I like to think of it in terms of energy. You're trying to get this system to minimize its energy or error or whatever you want to call it. But that's what you're trying to do in this particular particular case. With full self-driving, it's really complicated, right? You don't really know what the global minimum is. You can't ever drive perfectly. No human being has ever driven perfectly their whole lives or even for substantial portions of their lives, right? You always make mistakes. Now, if you're lucky, you don't get into an accident because you make a mistake and somebody else is doing okay. But, but you know, nobody can ever drive perfectly. So what is the global minimum or maximum, whichever 
whatever way you want to talk about it. What is the best you can possibly do? That's what Tesla is seeking out. And it's not an easy thing to solve. There's no simple equation that just says, solve this equation and you're done. You know exactly what the global minimum is. You're seeking it out all the time. And of course, what it actually looks like is much more like this, right? There's not just a couple of local minima. There are tons and tons and tons of local minima, minima some of which are really close to the global minimum. So you may not know. Uh, they could be close in space and they can also be close in terms of their error values. And of course, this is not limited to two-dimensional stuff. This can absolutely happen in three-dimensional space or four-dimensional space or a hundred-dimensional space. In fact, the Tesla full self-driving, I don't even want to take a guess, but I'm sure it's hundreds and hundreds of dimensions that they're trying to deal with here. So anyway, it's a multi-dimensional space that they're trying to find this global minimum in over here, right? They don't know where it is. They're just seeking around. They're looking all over the place. The neural networks are trying to do their job and figure it all out. And just to finish this off, this is a really cool diagram here. This gives you a good idea just because of the text labels and things like that. You're currently here and you're like, oh, I've optimized my solution. You know, my computer software or hardware or whatever it is, is doing great because I, I can't go up anywhere. I'm at this maximum. What you don't see is there's a better design over here. There's something that's way better than what you've done. But what you've got to do is take a risk and you've got to move out of this maximum into lower spaces and take a risk in terms of what you're doing in order to get up to or have a potential to get up to this better design. And by the way, haha, <laughs> success is one of the possible outcomes. This is on my merch store. I wore this on purpose today. I thought this was a brilliantly appropriate shirt. I just got it in the mail. So thank you to Dan and everybody who's working there. Uh, anyway, if you want one, definitely check out the link in the description. But I, I thought that was perfect because success is one of the possible outcomes. And what Elon means by success is getting to this better design. And in order to do that, you have to take risks. It's not a done deal. You don't just go like, aha, I can easily get from a pretty good solution to a very good solution. Take LiDAR and take radar. Those two things, people have been thinking for a long time that those two were necessary solutions to get a global solution, get the best global solution to full self-driving. And what they've done is they've achieved this local maximum and it looks really, really good, right? You've got Cruz working really well, Mobileye working well, Waymo working well, right? So they're working really well. They actually in many cases look better than Tesla, but they're at a local maximum. They can't scale. They can't really get better than that. What Tesla did, they said, throw out the LiDAR, throw out the radar, and we're going to take a few steps backwards. We're going to go down this thing, right? We're going to get worse instead of better for a while. But then what we've got, and when I talk about overhead in lots of my videos, I say, we've got more overhead now, right? They've re redone the stack. They've recreated the neural networks. They've redone the hardware, et cetera, et cetera. So they've got more headroom. This is what I mean by headroom. They can now approach a better design. Now, whether this is the absolute global maximum or minimum, right, I, I don't know, but at least they're able to go further. So they, they're here and they're like, oh, we're doing really well. And most people are like, we're just going to stay here. We're not going to go any further. We're afraid to make any moves. But Tesla says, nah, th throw out the baby with the bathwater. Try going, you know, down a few steps, see what happens. Then we may have a chance to move up. And success is one of the possible outcomes. Now, what also is one of the possible outcomes is failure. You could fail really, really badly. And that's one of the things that Elon Musk and his companies are amazing about. They are willing to risk so much. I mean, looking at SpaceX too with this Starship, they're putting in a lot of money for Starship and it's incredibly risky what they're doing. But, you know, Elon is incredibly motivated. He's like, I'm willing to take that risk. Most CEOs and most, frankly, most human beings are not willing to take that kind of risk. So kudos to him and SpaceX and Tesla and everybody for doing this. And hopefully Tesla will actually find this global map maximum or minimum when it comes to full self-driving and all of us in the entire world will benefit from it. All right. I hope you found this episode fun and thought provoking and interesting. If you did, please do like it so other people can find it. And of course, consider subscribing for more of this kind of content. Also, a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon. Thank you all so much for your support. I really do appreciate it. You know, I do this all by myself, got other jobs and stuff like that. It's amazing your support. It really, really helps me get me through this and to make this all possible. So thank you. And of course, if you want to join the team, definitely check out the link in the description. Also, as I said before, definitely check out the Success is One of the Possible Outcomes t-shirt. This is one of three new t-shirt designs I'll be wearing in subsequent episodes. And of course, we also have a bunch of other t-shirts, tumblers, mugs, etc. So definitely check them out on the merch store. And finally, don't forget, we are both Tesla and Amazon affiliates. If you look in the description, you can see how going shopping for a power wall, a solar roof, or anything on Amazon helps out the channel. In the meantime, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.